She was a formidable candidate in 2008. She was a great supporter of mine in the general election. She was an outstanding Secretary of State. She is my friend. I think she would be an excellent president. And I'm not on the ballot. Okay, let's get to work. Our first guest is political commentator and author of Hand to Mouth, Living in Bootstrap America. Let's welcome back Linda Torado. And he is the veteran Hi. economist, national columnist, and professor of business at the University of Maryland. Welcome back, Peter Morisi. Peter, Linda, thanks for joining us today. Nice to be with you. All right, let's go ahead and get to work. Hillary Clinton, what a shock. She is now going to run for the presidency of the United States. Linda, I'm certain that you were completely shocked by this announcement, but I'm also wondering if once you got a chance to see what Mrs. Clinton put out there on her very first day, if it impressed you at all. Um, I am never going to be a Hillary Clinton supporter simply because the first election I actually remember was already Bush v. Clinton. I've, I've done that. I've been there. I remember it. I would like something different, please. Um, but, you know, the announcement yesterday, I think the, the interesting thing, uh, the most interesting thing about it was that WikiLeaks accused Hillary of stealing their logo, which is just a fantastic uh, fantastic development. I, I think everybody knew it was coming. Uh, clearly, all the jokes have already been told, and now we're stuck with rehashes for the next 18 months. So, Peter, here we go. People are starting to already talk about the campaign, and of course, all the Republicans, at least most of them, have taken a shot at it. But you will say that there are some who would indicate it's fair. There was no policy discussion. There was nothing about what I'm going to do. It was a wonderful image speech, if you will. That was done perfectly. But do we really still know what Hillary Clinton stands for? Oh, I think we know what Hillary Clinton stands for. She stands for many of the things that Barack Obama does, though, domestically at least, uh, though she might do them a bit differently. But she's for national health care. She's for disadvantaging men, uh, villainizing them, keeping them out of college, keeping them from graduating, things of that nature. On foreign policy, she'd like to be tougher than Barack Obama, but to say she was an outstanding Secretary of State, I guess it was the plan all along to have the Russians in the Crimea create ISIS in the Middle East, turn Yemen over to terrorists, and to have the, the Chinese on the march in the South China Sea. I guess those were all his objectives, because as I look around the world, America's in retreat, and it's largely, I, I, I think of the, the picture that I wish the Republicans had put up yesterday was Hillary Clinton pushing that restart button, and then those Russian armored vehicles sweeping across the Ukraine. It was a great restart. That's all I have to say. Peter, speaking of pictures, let's talk about what they did in Brooklyn, where there were pictures, there were signs that were put up yesterday with Mrs. Clinton's face on it. And it looked at some of the words that her campaign has said should not be used to describe her, such as secretive, ambitious, and entitled. They say that this is borderline sexist to call her this. Peter, hold on just a second here. If you're going it, to, it's an old saying of mine, you know, if, if you're going to want to play lumberjack, you've got to learn to handle your end of the log here. So she has to understand that she's going to get hammered away. This, does this sound sexist to you? No, it's not sexist. And uh, I mean, these are fair criticisms. To say she's secretive hasn't got anything to do with gender. There are men that are secretive that are women that are secretive. What she plans to do over and over again is to make herself seem vulnerable to wom women because she's women, a woman and bank on winning 51% of the electorate. But I guess if Americans really want to understand this candidacy, it's time to revive a play on Broadway. Evita, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina should be her campaign theme song because this is about the power trip of a woman. But I have to say something else. Yesterday, she was darn effective and the Republicans were pathetic. If you think about how uh, Barack Obama managed to dethrone her last time, it was by offering an alternative, positive image. We might not agree with his policies, but he offered people hope not criticism. Yesterday, the Republicans showed them, basically, she won the first inning. Okay, 30, 40 seconds we have left here, Linda. Do you think the Republicans are going to be able to attack Mrs. Clinton here without being called sexist at every corner? I think if they don't use sexist attacks, it's entirely possible. For example, you can talk about free trade, you can talk about secrecy, you can talk about power, you can talk about a lot of things with Hillary Clinton, but saying that she's trying to take away men's college scholarships is an awful lot like saying Barack Obama is coming for your guns. It's a low attack, it's not necessary, it's not even really helpful to the electorate. I think there's a lot of reasons to not like Hillary outside of her gender, but I don't see Republicans staying away from that trap. And that's going to be interesting to see how well Republicans 
Republicans corral their own people to stop them from talking like Hold on a sec. Hold on a sec, Peter. I'm up against the clock. I see you with your hands up, but I only got a couple of seconds. Let me take a break. I'm going to come back and let you get in here because Peter Morisi will not be denied if he has one of those moments in here. Linda Toronto, Peter Morisi, please stand by. Uh, we'll get his response. And also when we come back, Marco Rubio is next. We'll discuss his candidacy and more when the arena on Midpoint continues. Back to the arena. Also, political commentator, author of Hand Him Out, Living in Bootstrap America, Linda Toronto, veteran economist and professor of business at the University of Maryland, Peter Morisi, who was nice enough to put up the finger to hold up his hand to say that he wanted to throw in a retort there right afterwards. Linda, I think you may have absolutely, uh, you may have be going up against the snake here because uh, somebody's <coughs> unhappy. Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> oh, I'm not unhappy, but you just saw an example of how the Clinton campaign works. Now, Linda is a conservative, but she's also a woman. I raised the issue of men in higher education, and she said, well, you can't beat her by saying you're going to take away men's scholarships. I don't think I'm talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that she's campaigning on the notion that girls are disadvantaged in schools when it's boys that are dropping out, boys that are not going to college, and in college, 60% of the degrees are being awarded to women, not men. Women don't need any more advantages in schools. They're already feminist enterprises. But I raise those issues, and those are hard facts. Those are numbers, and you get offended. Now, I don't think you meant to, but that's, that's the button that she's hitting in women that's going to make her so hard to beat. All right, Linda, the button's been pushed. Yeah, uh, to begin with, what you actually said was that she's working on taking away college scholarships from men. And what I said was that line of reasoning is actually going to be about as effective as saying Barack Obama is coming for your guns. Secondly, I'm not a conservative. I'm a liberal and libertarian at best. Thirdly, I do think that you have a point there, and I'm not saying that those demographics and those statistics aren't there. What I'm saying is that we could focus on gender issues, period, the end, or we could be talking about NAFTA, we could be talking about free trade, we could be talking about foreign policy. And the fact that you have a female candidate, and the question is, is it going to be sexist attacks instead of, here are all of the reasons we don't want her elected, is to me derailing and also not going to go over terribly well with the electorate, regardless of how the campaign is pushing buttons and regardless of their demographics graphics, it's incumbent on those of us who actually are working on these things to talk about things that are going to resonate in important issues. I don't think that Hillary Clinton being a female while women also get more college degrees is as germane as Russia. But Linda, so you do know, however, though, that there's going to be a time on the left when something's going to happen and they're going to push that button. Somebody will sooner or later somewhere down the road in this campaign and they will say the only reason you said that, speaking to someone on the right, about Mrs. Clinton is because she's a woman. You know that that's going to happen. Oh, absolutely. But the question isn't, should we be inviting those conversations? I think the thing that we do is talk about legitimate issues, foreign policy, the big things, and then we let politics be politics. But when we mix campaigning and policy, then we run into these issues. That's more the point that I was making, is it's one thing to throw okay. out boilerplate things for your, for your base. It's another thing entirely to take them seriously. So, Peter, then how does the GOP basically cut that off because we know it's going to happen and we know it's going to turn some people against the Republicans the minute they hear that it's a sexist campaign. Well, you see, I think you have to present it in positive terms as opposed to a response to her. What I don't hear a Republican saying is that, you know, I wanted to restore American prosperity. The answer to your problems is a better job and this is how I'm going to provide it. If you start talking about exchange rates, free trade and foreign policy, you'll end up like Mitt Romney with 47 percent of the vote and lose because Mrs. Clinton is doing is offering women a ready solution and that is a solution that women like and that is rules and laws okay she's going to change the law so that they will be paid more now whether she can effectively do that or not is another matter but that's what she's going to promise and they're 51 percent of the electorate with that in mind it's going to, and the notion that you know a lot of women have decided it's just time if they don't address the gender issue from the point of view of poking holes in areas where Mrs. Clinton is in error about the facts and proposing things that are erroneous, uh, they can't. Win. They they have to address this. Is my point of view. So what you're saying? I only got about a minute. I only got about a minute left here, and I want to make sure does. I get this through, Peter. What you're saying here is that in many ways it's time to stop worrying about saying it's time and worry more about the health and welfare of the country. Yesterday, yesterday she made the promise to make people better off, much the way Barack Obama did. 
but 59% of the electorate want the next president to, re to repeal essentially Obama's policies, according to a CNN, CNN poll last week. They want a different approach, but they want the same outcomes. They're not satisfied with Obamacare. Mrs. Clinton will propose something else. Well, you know, the Republicans better propose something else as well. What they did yesterday was to attack her, and that is a losing proposition. It makes them less appealing than her. 20 seconds we here before we take a break, it. Linda. Go ahead. I'm sorry. 20 seconds. We found climate there. What Republicans need to be doing is making an affirmative case and not going after Hillary Clinton because it's so predictable they'll do that. And what they have to do, of course, I guess, would then be to say, let's stop worrying about it's time. And as I said, let's worry about what's good for the country. That's what the that Republicans are going to have yes. to do. That's going to be a very tough road to hoe. Because they have to know. have their own gender message. Indeed. Not which, one that attacks her, but one that shows sympathy, understanding, and solutions. Something that they have been missing drastically here in the last couple of years and they have to work on. Please stand by a couple of moments. Peter Morisi and Linda Tirado, uh, I promise we will then get to Marco Rubio, plus a terrible incident in Panama City during a spring break and oh yeah, a few other surprises in store as the Midpoint Arena continues. All right, let's get back to work, if you will. Political commentator, author of Hand to Mouth, Living in Bootstrap America, Linda Toronto, and veteran economist, professor of business at the University of Maryland, Peter Morisi. All right, Peter, let's go ahead and start with Marco Rubio. He will announce tonight that he is going to try to become president of the United States. He's going to give up his Senate seat. Some people, oddly enough, in the last 24 hours, I've said that he has the best chance of anybody. Well, but the problem with it is he says he's uniquely qualified, and not to cast aspersions here, but what is he uniquely qualified for to be president? Well, I think that he has the capacity, along with the governor of Wisconsin, to actually win Hispanic votes. Unless the Republicans can poll in the high 30s or low 40s with Hispanics, we might as well not play the Super Bowl. Hillary Clinton's president. Period. Uh, the basic problem he has with Hispanics is that Cuban, you know, we, we think of Hispanics as a bunch, us white guys. You know, they're all kind of in together. But it's like the Europeans. They're not. They're Italians and Poles and Swedes. He's Cuban. And he's a Cuban Brahmin, and that is that that the Cubans that came here, although though he was not advantaged, the many of them are advantaged, and they're seen differently within the Latino community. And as a consequence, he is not as appealing as say would be a Mexican American from New Mexico who pulled himself up. Well, let's not but also still, forget that, that the Latin potential. community, the Latin American community, has a lot of problems with his stance on immigration too. A lot of people disagree with him there, and think that's what makes him unelectable to them. Well, the problem is he's trying to appeal to both communities, and this is why the Republicans can't win elections. You know, you have to pick the fights you can win, and immigration is not one they can win. I don't particularly like the fact that we let, you know, millions of people come here and stay for long periods of time, become dependent on them, and can now not realistically send them back. Every human rights activist in the world would be on the back of the United States of America if we did, as Mitt Romney suggested, put them on pickup trucks and send them home. The fact is, they are here, and the Republicans had better make friends with them, because they're all going to have kids, and those kids are going to vote. Instead, you know, this endless debate about what to do with them, no, it doesn't work. We're going to have to just accept that they're here. All right, Linda, to you. Can Marco Rubio then, if he heals all these wounds, could he defeat Hillary Clinton in a general election? Well, I mean, I think the election of Barack Obama shows that none of us have any idea this early what's going to happen. I do think it's problematic that he's already got Tea Partiers in Florida saying they won't support him, that he's burned them. Florida's moving to a winner-take-all state, so if it's Rubio versus Bush, we know who wins there, and we know who wins uh, if Florida's switched. But more to the point on immigration, I really, um, I, I actually completely agree with Peter. I don't think that, that Republicans are handling it well. I think that Rubio's divisive on the issue, because no matter what you do, there is no way to split that baby and be Solomon and make everybody happy. So you're pretty much already turning off half of your electorate, no matter how you go. And Bush is just a little more masterful at handling those sorts of things. Things. I think Rubio is going to be a great gadfly, but I don't see him having more traction than a cruise. A couple of other issues that we have here that I wanted to make sure we got to. This one repulsed me when I read it. Two Alabama college students, two young men who go to Troy University, one is 22, one is 23. They were suspended. They've been arrested. Cops in Panama City Beach found a cell phone video that allegedly shows them sexually assaulting an incapacitated woman on a beach chair at a Florida beach while others stood around, watched, and took videos of this. 
The sheriff said it was very, very graphic and the most disgusting, sickening thing he had ever seen. Linda, what the hell is wrong with us here? I mean, this is supposed to be a spring break here that's gotten out of control, and we have rapes happening in front of people who won't even step in to stop it. Yeah, and that is actually reality for American women and women across the world, that you can't assume that every dude's going to be like that, but you're never entirely sure that you're not going to pass out on a beach chair and have a, a crowd around you. So when, when we're talking about what's to be done there, what's to be done is strong public condemnation, a full trial, and harsh consequences for things like that. What is it part of? I don't know, but I do know that we see things like this happening more and more frequently, that we see people recording things passively that are horrible uh, and, and just putting them on the internet like it's it's what you do these days so I think frankly I would love to see that be a national discussion of how do we handle this new culture where something like that is considered acceptable to so many people that they'll stand around and watch Peter doesn't this need to be that national discussion though because this is reprehensible I think that we agree I, I, I have nothing further to add other than that I agree but I would say on another point is this is an illustration of a point I've been trying to make on this broadcast and others for a long time, and that is we're stuffing into colleges and universities people we have no business having, and permissive, left-wing, liberal, whatever, administrations don't have the courage to enforce standards, so they throw characters like th these people out before something like this happens. We just have too many people that don't belong in American universities for many reasons. They're intellectually incapacitated, and frankly, they don't have the moral fiber to be people that we want to give that kind of power to, the power that comes with a, gra a diploma. Uh, they just don't deserve it. Uh, somebody was appalled today that we have more, and was saying he was going to campaign on the notion that we have more jails than colleges. Now, to some degree, we don't have all the people in jail that we should have there. All right, let's go ahead and end out then. You talk about how people are always going after certain opinions. Here's something interesting I thought we would end on. There's a, the American Library Association on Monday, the list of 10 books receiving the most complaints from parents, educators, and others. Linda, I'll start with you. And Tango Makes Three is a book about two male penguins raising a baby penguin, and it has created an absolute furor. Is it worth it? Uh, to begin with, it's scientific fact that male penguins do pair up and raise baby penguins. And if you're scared of science, then I worry about your parenting. Secondly, you know, look, we, we've been doing this for as long as there's been humans and printed material. Somebody sees something, reads it, gets outraged because somebody else might read it. I have more faith in people than that. I think you can tell your children you're not allowed to read this or that book if you so choose. Um, and I, I tend to stay away from uh, taking books out of libraries ever in any case. For an educator then, Peter, 45 seconds to you. I think we have to be very careful about banning books, period. I, I think that why I might not give that book to my children when I had small children, I don't object to it being there as long as there's lots of choices and parents can, can choose among, among things. Now, if a teacher handed these out and said, you need to read this, this is an assignment, this is part of the course to my second grader, you know, then I would be upset. And we should point out, too, that the Harry Potter novels, the Twilight novels, and the Hunger Games series, these were all books that the ALA were reporting on and basically wanted to remove some from shelves at one point. Now what do we do? We go to theme parks and we celebrate Harry Potter and we go on rides and everybody watches it. It still is Darwin. up to the... Uh, it, what now? Darwin. Copernicus. <laughs> I, we I, have a long history of banning books in Western culture to know of, to bad effect. No. It's, it's, a, it's a perfect point, and it still is up to the parents to do the right thing. Peter Marisi, Linda Torado, pleasure to have you both on the show. Thanks so much. We'll talk again soon. Thanks, Thank Seth. You. All right, be good. Wet and rainy conditions for the South and Gulf Coast leading to possible flash floods. That and your daily temps with Jessica Reyes and the Newsmax weather update. This weather is sponsored by eVoice, simple, affordable, better. Hi, I'm Jessica Reyes with your weather from coast to coast. We're going to start off with the good news. Warm and dry across the four corners with mainly sunny skies into Bakersfield and Flagstaff, Arizona as well. Not so much the further eastward we move because we're dealing with showers and thunderstorms and lots of it. Localized flood threat, a lot of road closures as you step out today into parts of Texas, into parts of the Gulf of Mexico, pretty much across most of the eastern portion of the country. So take it easy as you head out. Um, Again, even into parts of Florida, not so much across southern portions of the state where it's mainly sunny, especially into parts of Miami. So if you're heading out, that's a good place to be today. Across the northeast for today, across the Atlantic coastline, and mainly sunny with daytime highs feeling very spring-like in the 60s, even into the 70s with partly sunny skies in the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. Here are some of your daytime highs.
Come summer, let's all get ready to swelter. Then again, after what happened this winter, I think a lot of people would be very happy with that, too. All right, Hillary Clinton wants to be your champion, but first, she needs to survive the second round of the arena. That's when Midpoint continues next.